really lovely to see you all here tonight for my talk at the Museum of Royal Worcester. And thank you, Sophie, for your introduction. Um, I'm Dr. Lisa Sheppey. I'm an artist and researcher. And I was awarded my doctorate last year from the Centre for Print Research at the University of West of England in Bristol. My study was based on the historic and near obsolete technique of tissue transfer printing through the lens of contemporary printmaking. And tonight I'm going to talk about the highlights of my study and most importantly here where the story began at Royal Worcester. The process of transferring a delicate printed pattern onto porcelain began, began here around 1750 with Dr. Wall and Robert Hancock. Defined by its distinctive aesthetic, recognizable as an intricate image constructed from lines and dots in a monochrome color, the distinctive halo effect to the printed marks are achieved through two separate firings when the color flows readily into the clay body so the printed marks appear painterly with soft tonal ranges. The most well-known pattern was a Chinese-inspired motif known as the willow pattern. Excuse me. Tissue transferware has never been made accessible to art practice, even though the printed image offers distinctive autographic mark making possibilities. So what was underglazed tissue transfer, transfer printed ceramics? It is a bit of a tongue twister. So I refer to it as tissue transferware and describe it in my study as an industrial craft. Much of the knowledge surrounding this craft has been lost as the pottery industries have closed or replaced printing on ceramics with newer and more cost-effective forms of decoration. Unlike many industrial forms of printmaking, such as screen printing, tissue transferware has never made the transition from industry to contemporary art practice. It uses a particular method of production, which in general terms works like this. The pattern is printed with ink containing ceramic material and oil onto thin tissue paper. This is derived from an intaglio printmaking process and the use of copper plate engraving. The printed pattern on the tissue is transferred onto, onto the ceramic form and remains in place with manual manipulation and the viscosity of the ink. The printed tissue is malleable and can therefore reach into complex three-dimensional surfaces. The pattern is underglazed and kiln fired on the wear before a final glaze firing renders the ceramic object resilient and impervious to liquid. During the 19th century, many blue and white patterns would have been decorated in this way. So in this talk, I'm gonna talk about the highlights of my research project which took a number of years to complete, beginning with the museum archive here at Worcester, which provided the beginnings and the inspiration for the study. The aim of the study was to design and document a practice-based inquiry on a method of producing tissue transferware through the lens of contemporary printmaking. In doing this, a historic and near obsolete industrial craft would be reinstated and preserved for future creatives. Tonight, I'm firstly going to discuss the archival research I made at the museum, which provided the foundation for the investigation and enabled it to progress. The second phase of the research presents derived principles based from historical research, demonstrating a technically working method. The final and concluding part of this talk, I reveal my artist's position from which I was able to respond, visualizing its artistic potential in a series of printed, printed ceramic artworks, thus advoc advocating a future for it. The archive at Royal Worcester initiated the research with detail of the transferware narrative and Royal Worcester's contribution to it. The archive resonance throughout the study, delivering direct and personal interaction with tangible materials 
connected to creative human endeavor. In the archive, I had open access to primary material dating from the 1750s, from which I was able to respond, sorry, record, reflect and respond creatively. During these archival visits to Worcester, I was able to study the unseen artifacts which contain the human hub of ceramic production at Worcester. Initially, I focused on the archive as a whole and searched for any material related to tissue transfer ware production, such as copper plate engravings, transfer pattern books and tissue prints. However, I soon discovered other primary material meaningful to the project. This included design pattern books dating back to the 19th century, a design reference library and original paintings and drawings made by artists who were designers working in the pottery. Apart from the printed literature, the other material contained hand rendered content, such as written notes, letters, ledgers, recipes, drawings, designs and paintings, a visual arrangement of connected ephemera associated with Worcester's ceramic manufacturing past. I am attracted to the DNA of pottery workers within the materials such as the pattern books, which presented, represented the meticulous slow work of the designers and artists in the 19th and 20th centuries. The taxonomy of patterns neatly presented as reference material represents slow, quiet work rendered by the tactile touch of pen and ink on paper. Watercolour washes of mixed colour with handwritten notes making references to glazes and numbered copper, pl copper plates. The books contain oil stains, annotations, dates, fingerprints, paint splashes and sellotape, all indicative of constant use within the ceramic industry. This features two views of pressed seaweed volume two, a beautifully preserved book containing pressed and dried seaweed. The fragments presented in the book discolored to a pink color with crystals of salt attached. This book together with others represents a valuable resource for the designers at Worcester. It was intriguing to view the design library as evidence of the reference material used historically, investigating the visual world as a component of the design, the design process. The Ladies' Amusement by Robert Sayer, 1762, is a compilation of images produced by fashionable illustrators from that period for the purpose of inspiration and interpretation. The museum has co two copies and I was directed to this volume as an example of source imagery from the 18th century. Many of these images would have been interpreted by the engravers from the pottery for transfer, for transfer printing. Robert Hancock was the artist and engraver attributed to many of Worcester's early printed pieces. This shows the exquisite work by the engraver Robert Hancock, 1763, and demonstrates how the engraved marks transform from the copper plate onto the, into the finished printed and glazed ceramic cup. Robert Hancock is said to have introduced a method of transfer print, which was unrivaled in terms of its clarity and detail. This became a highly valued and desirable genre of ceramics. He was presented under the French artist Simon Francois Ravenet and trained to copy many of the French masters, such as Watteau, Boucher and Lancre from the French Rococo style. The success of Hancock's transfer technique helped to establish Worcester as a leading manufacturer of transfer printed porcelain and he subsequently became a partner in the business with Dr. John Wall in 1772. In the next part of the presentation, I demonstrate each part of my derived production method, linking traditional, 
autographic and manual material practices with the digital and mechanical, fusing printmaking and ceramic knowledge. I describe the historical method of producing transferware and illustrate how, as a printmaker, I have designed a new process based on these deductions. The one thing we need to be aware of here is that in the potteries, transferware was produced within an industrial manufacturing system devised called the divisions of labor, meaning that each individual was solely responsible for their part and not the whole process. The production of a method which could potentially be performed by a single practitioner materialized the research and presented a new interpretation of tissue transferware for artistic invention. The engraving printmaking process kickstarts the industrial method of production, requiring technical and manual skills, but also the autographic and interpretative skills of the individual engraver. This is a highly skilled and time consuming process. To complete an engraving for one dinner plate would take approximately two months. For a large serving dish, up to six months. The apprenticeship to become an engraver was five years and the, tra the training took place within the pottery under the master engraver. Engraving plates were highly valued in the potteries and were traded as currency. And for this study, I was lucky enough to have the pleasure of meeting and interviewing Paul Holdway, who was the master engraver at Spode. His input was vital to the understanding of the process, as much of his knowledge was tacit and difficult to describe in simple terms. When Spode closed in 2008, the team of 12 engravers became unemployed and never again worked professionally with the engraving process in an industrial context. Firstly, drawing with digital tools to interpret the mark making characteristics of the copper plate engraving enabled the production of printing plates. At the outset, my objective was to equip myself with digital drawing tools so I could respond both creatively and technically, thus championing a method of printmaking previously closed to non-specialists. The designs were created with digital vector graphics beginning with those available on an iPad and advancing to the Wacom tablet and Adobe Illustrator. An online laser engraving bureau replaced the manual tooling required to construct a copper plate engraving. This facilitated iterative testing of variables of the process to take place effectively without losing momentum. Many examples of early transferware use the effective cobalt oxide as a blue colorant, which is instantly recognizable. Historically, the ceramic underglaze ink for printing was prepared in-house. Therefore, very few recipes exist that could be repeatable by today's health and safety standards. The ink was a challenge and a threat to the effectiveness of the process, and this had to be overcome through manual dexterity and discovering effective components that blended and printed effectively. The tissue paper used for transfer printing was thin, but strong and initially sized with soft soap. I would describe it as being rather like cigarette paper. The sizing enables the tissue to remain flexible and helps the printed image stick to the paper and pick up the ink effectively. And these beautiful push tissue prints are in the archive at Worcester. Printing in the potteries followed an intaglio method of printmaking, which technically works like this. The ink was applied onto the copper plate and worked into the recess of the engraved marks, loosened with heat. The plate is wiped firmly and continuously until the ink remains in the recessed marks and the uppermost surface of the plate is clean. Printing the design onto the tissue with intaglio methods echoes that used in the potteries. 
The difference is that no heat is used in the inking up for this method. Using my etching press, the inked white plate is placed onto the bed of the press, covered with tissue, dampened on the back with soft soap, then secured with a number of blankets. The plate then passes through the press, backwards and forwards to ensure the ink is printed effectively onto the tissue. As the tissue was printed, it was cut manually to shape and placed print down onto the unglazed ware. Then with the use of friction, the paper was smoothed and rubbed with a piece of flannel to transfer the image. This was a highly skilled, efficient operation and there remains only one pottery, Burley in Stoke-on-Trent, who still employs these transfer printing methods. After transferring, the wear is fired twice. In the first firing, the printed pattern is hardened on at a low temperature, which renders the print stable on the wear and burns away the print residues. The final clear glaze firing is much higher and laminates the printed pattern under the glaze and renders the ceramic object resilient to continuous domestic use. Through years of tacit knowledge, professional transferers give the illusion of an effortless operation. However, this is far from the case for a newcomer. And when the tissue is released from the plate, it is flimsy and likely to stick onto itself. So it needs to be handled quickly and efficiently and placed into the final transferring position the print is burnished from the back with pressure, leaving the printed pattern from the tissue onto the ceramic surface. The two firing schedules follow a traditional method and do not change from historical deductions. At this point in the research, I had a precise method of production which could move the work from tests to artworks. Here I include a short video and it shows the process I've just described from mixing the ink to printing and transferring a pattern. In the final part of this talk tonight, I reveal my artist position with a discussion of my background and some influences. As an artist, my relationship to printmaking has been a gradual one. Originally trained in fine art as a painter, I became frustrated with the singular medium and its limitations. My continuous interest in printmaking and its transformative properties were initiated on my MA in multidisciplinary printmaking and beyond, as I was attracted to ceramics and glass as ways of carrying and encasing the printed image to explore the material connections between the substrate and the printed image. In a previous project, I worked in the archive at the Bronte Parsonage Museum in Haworth in Yorkshire examining garments once belonging to Charlotte Bronte. The museum was previously the private residence of the Bronte family. No photography was allowed in this instance, so all responses were generated through drawing and note-taking with a pencil. The act of drawing from observation, the objects containing the traces of previous inhabitants, 
with haptic interaction introduced me personally to the Bronte narrative and the lives of these women experienced through their clothing. I've always been driven to explore new material practices. And for this series of work, I connected kiln firing schedules for enamel transfers to glass firing, enabling me to laminate and collage printed imagery within glass panels. This echoed the physical museum and the glass vitrine, enshrined, sorry, housing enshrined evocative objects, imbuing a jewel-like and melancholic presence. Here I show one of the works in this series, Charlotte's Dress, which was a prize-winning work at the British Glass Biennale. The printed image with metal foil inclusions unify the glass vignettes and allow for fluidity and a freedom of expression which I continued to cultivate until I began my PhD in 2017. The pattern books in the museum and the clothing belonging to Charlotte Bronte had long lost their function. However, their resonance was still powerful as they became evocative, tangible objects. I investigated the archives at the Museum of Royal Worcester to decipher the production methods of industrial decorated ceramics and, provided start and to provide starting points for creative responses. The relationship between artist and researcher was simultaneous as I searched for clues in the objects connected to an intensely human activity of making. In this detail from one of the pattern books, I was scrutinizing the process of making embedded in the pages. I observed the laborious acts of recording the patterns to make a taxonomy of imagery as a commodity for the ceramics industry. From being anonymous things in a museum, they became transformed into my evocative objects from which I was able to bring personal connections and meaning. The most straightforward and immediate way to record an image is through drawing. However, I needed to find a digital equivalent to be able to translate drawings into engravings. I sought to interpret hand-rendered copper plate engraving with digital laser engraving technology, presenting previously closed printmaking methods with a contemporary and accessible version. Through the use of digital vector drawing methods, I could make mul multiples of the same image and export them as laser engraved printing plates. In addition to this, I endeavoured to devise a method of print, um, sorry, a method to print tissue transfer with an accumulative pattern onto an entire compound surface. Working digitally with each of my photographic images taken from the archive, Opened in Adobe Illustrator, I increased the scale of the individual hand-rendered marks to create a microscopic image. This began a series of responses, looking in forensic detail at the form of the works, the line, the shape, the pattern, reconstructing a digital drawing interpretation of the original. In doing this, I interacted and connected with the technical and artistic expertise of the original engraving to make my own interpretation. Through drawing with tools in Illustrator, I was able to familiarize myself and become closer to the subject and separate the formal elements of the engra engraved mark making. At the time of making these responses, we were required to work from home because of the COVID-19 pandemic. I chose to respond to other objects which had a personal connection, such as this packaging, which held face masks dating back to the 1960s. I was attracted to the historic graphic style of, of illustration, whilst picturing an instruction to wear the mask and protect your health. The imagery was dystopian and related to a universal feeling of uncertainty in the years 2020 to 2021, when we were living through the global health threat of the COVID-19 pandemic. 
the juxtaposition to flower imagery worked as a powerful contrast. My intention here was to make a taxonomy of imagery using 21st century digital drawing tools to reference the 19th century human activity of design generation based on my scrutiny of the pattern books in Worcester's archive. In this discussion, I have described the drawing process using Adobe Illustrator to replicate a tissue transfer engraving mark making, replacing lines and dots with a vector graphic interpretation. In doing this, I was able to produce my own pattern books whilst formulating a visual alphabet and image bank for intuitive collage methods for creative expression. Here I present my responses to the tissue transferware narrative as a pattern book of source images. This provided the visual threads to respond through, sorry, the visual threads to resonate through and into the final ceramic artworks. Excuse me. <laughs> a challenge in the sequence of creative decisions was how to make three-dimensional shapes with a limited professional knowledge of ceramic construction. The shapes would provide a, pr a printing canvas for compound surfaces and demonstrate the distinct character of tissue transfer printmaking. I considered using ready-made biscuit ware, but on reflection, decided this would be neither an original or visually challenging. I refer here to Henry Sandon's book from 1969, Worcester Porcelain, 1751 to 1793. In this, Sandon details hardened on shards from the 1760s to 1770s, found on the Warmstry House, house site when it was excavated in 1968. Many of the shards showed the printing and painting of underglazed patterns, providing another example identifying Worcester's initial contribution to the development of tissue printing. The shards lost and found hold information to the origins of the tissue, tissue printed ceramics at Worcester and can be linked to the development of the underglazed method of the method before its move to Staffordshire where the process was fully exploited to mass produce transferware ceramics. The fragmented shards are containers for historic, for ceramic histories, informing us of processes, people and dates. These images are my own collection of excavated shards from my own house as referencing as reference to shape and form. My aim was to echo the shard fragments excavated from the archaeological finds that identified Worcester as an instigator of the original transferware process. After a number of discussions with my supervisors at the Centre for Print Research, I decided that extrusion of clay shapes would be a, a way to progress the study with clay forms on which to transfer print my designs. I discussed my ideas with reference to the manual and mechanical, combining the two fundamental elements and technologies, ceramic extrusion and tissue transfer printing. The dies for extrusion were fabricated using 3D printed technology and implied connections to the industrial past of tool making whilst being innovative and from the 21st century. The cross-fertilisation of new and historic technologies worked theoretically, thematically and visually with the project. The clay moved slowly through the extruder and the hydraulic pump powering it through the die to form a shape. These images show the process of extrusion as a means to ma manipulate form with gentle and minimal handling to shape and model the clay. I was happy with the way the machine and hand could work in sync. Gently forming the shapes whilst twisting the form into a natural curve appeared crude, but suggested part of a functional object with a visual connection to excavation and archeology. span The abstract forms created through the extrusion at first alluded to industrial functional ceramic objects such as soil piping and guttering. 
far removed from the decorative ceramic, ceramics traditionally associated with transfer wear. Once fired to a biscuit, these are my compound ceramic shapes and they became my printing canvases. I chose, I chose to change my color palette from the single dominant blue color associated with tissue transfer wear to include a range of colors. The decision, the decision to use a new color palette with multi-printed, sorry, multi-layered printed imagery further transformed the material outcomes from tests to final artworks. I discovered that the transferred colors could be collaged and layered without lifting the colors underneath during the transferring stage, enabling the printed image to become accumulative and painterly. Introducing a new color, color palette and moving away from the recognizable blue and white pattern brought a contemporary color aesthetic to my transfer wear and advocated more of its creative potential. Here shows the results of testing new colors before committing to the final outcomes. These fragmented forms not only relate to historical findings and my archival study, but they also provided a complete 3D printing surface on which to tissue transfer print my collection of designs, imbuing the transfer wear narrative from my perspective, the printmaker. Collage as a form of visual language underpins my practice as a printmaker in these final works, where I manipulated and constructed the printed marks to build a composite image. Assembling and arranging a selection of images as a collage allowed for a fluid and creative way of making, beginning with no real plan or preconceived design, the imagery emerged and transformed into a final printed object. Ceramic construction with machine and manual procedures produced a series of 3D shapes which unified the material research while referring, the frag referring to fragments of history excavated in the archaeological findings from Worcester. The application of layered printed imagery producing nuances of colour with soft tonal ranges appealed to my fine art sensibilities as a printed surface emerged from the white ceramic substrate. As an artist, I enjoy an element of surprise when printed image imagery is positioned and juxtaposed to create visual dialogues. For the series of artworks, the familiar flower pattern based on Worcester's pattern books was situated alongside the dystopian masked figure to establish my visual alphabet for this series of work. The juxtaposition of patterns interpreted from anonymous labor represent collective works in pattern books, which are now restricted items from view in the archive at Royal Worcester. The transfer wear narrative evoked in the imagery was facilitated by collage methods, creating a printed, composite image that is removed from the traditional and instantly identifiable single blue and white pattern. I have endeavored to contribute to new knowledge through my PhD study to interpret a historical method of ceramic decoration and give it new life. My innovation is reinterpreting a historical process, not replacing it maintaining engraving printmaking at the center. Engraving for tissue transfer was an industrial but human automated process and the repetition of mark making produced the same motifs and subsequently was never a printmaking method for artists. This knowledge was hidden inside the closed factory. This study has exposed this knowledge with a walkthrough demonstration of how the method works technically which I created by responding as both a researcher and artist. Through this, I have established the potential and future for tissue transfer wear so that it will become part of creative practice in the future. Since I've been awarded my doctorate, I've been busy sharing aspects of my outcomes and knowledge with others, 
I've exhibited a number of my printed pieces um, that were selected for the Royal Society for Painter Printmakers and the Woolwich Contemporary Printmaking Exhibitions in London, as well as appearing in some articles in Printmaking Today and Pressing Matters. And I'm hoping to write a book. So I continue to be driven to material exploration and developments derived from my research, and I'm looking forward to new collaborations and projects. I just want to say one thing now I'm approaching the end of this talk. I'd like to thank Paul Holdway, who I think is here tonight, who I mentioned earlier, because without his input in my project, it wouldn't have been as good or enjoyable. Thank you for sharing your knowledge and your stories of working as a master engraver at Spode. May I end this talk with especially thanking Sophie for inviting me here and I look forward to exciting future events at Worcester. So watch this space. Thank you.